This just in, the devastating fallout from Mohammed Hijab's humiliating interview with Sheikh Yasser Qadi continues to destroy the foundations of Islam in new and epic ways. If you're the only person on the internet who doesn't know what I'm talking about, the grape ape of Islamic apologetics, Muhammad Hijab, asked Sheikh Yasser Qadi some probing questions about the history of the Quran, and the answers Sheikh Yasser Qadi gave shook the faith of so many Muslims so quickly that Hijab was forced to delete that portion of the interview. Unfortunately for Hijab, people had already downloaded it, and Hijab got a crash course on the Streisand effect, the principle that when people find out you're trying to hide something from them, they suddenly become more interested in what you're trying to hide. Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Ulum al-Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf al qiraat When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. The issue of Ahruf and preservation and Qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. Here's the point. These issues should only be discussed amongst people who know what the qiraat are. What was the crisis? I mentioned it, referenced it, but I never explicitly said it. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. Issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. And I don't like these idiots, and they are idiots, wallahi, because they're the ones who caused this. In this issue, they're utter idiots who did something haram. And I don't like saying this. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya akhi. It's not wise. You don't understand qiraat. Let it be. In later videos, I'll have much more to say about Sheikh Qadi's brutal smackdown of the Quran. But for now, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to a textual critic of Quran manuscripts who just made his first video because he wants to shed some much needed light on this discussion. Dr. Daniel Brubaker is the author of this book, Corrections in Early Quran Manuscripts. You can get this on Amazon. The link is in the description box. His channel is called Variant Quran. The link to his channel is in the description box. In his first video, he shows a photo of a page of an early Quran manuscript, and there are missing words. Words that are in today's Quran, but not in that early Quran. Now, the way he leads into this is interesting. There's the original writing of a passage of Surah 9 on the page, but Dr. Brubaker shows that a later editor added some corrections to the manuscript. You can tell because the writing is different. So, someone edited the text sometime after it was written. However, the editor didn't fix some missing words from Surah 9 verse 80. Let's watch a clip about the missing words so we can see clear proof that Allah has not perfectly preserved His words and that Allah was not miraculously protecting copies of the Quran. And so when we come to the last line of the page, this is what uh, the main point that I want to um, illustrate. We notice that the scribe who first wrote the page actually left out three words when it was, if we're comparing it to the text that is now in common use uh, today around the world in the, in the Hoff's text and the Cairo edition. So, and, and that all the traditions point back toward. So, <clears throat> um, so this manuscript is, is variant. Not only was it variant at the time of first writing, but the other interesting thing to note, and the reason I showed you the other two corrections on the page, is that somebody came back to this page at a later time after production and corrected it. And whoever that was, however, did not correct uh, or did not see a need to correct the uh, omission at this spot. So I, th I find that very interesting. So these words... Uh, stand as they were first written. So two people, at least, uh, well, possibly one of them, made a mistake uh, by omitting something, or possibly didn't. Possibly thought that that was the way that it was supposed to be written. 
and possibly the second one, the corrector, either made a mistake and didn't see it, or uh, once again reviewed it and thought that that was the way that it was supposed to be written. So I find that interesting. Now let's take another look uh, before we finish up here at the verse itself and read it there. It says, it is the same whether or not you beg forgiveness for them. Though you ask forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah will not forgive them. That is because they disbelieved in Allah and in his messenger. And that last little bit is cut off, but that's what it says. So this verse can be read um, sensibly, grammatically correct, with or without the uh, sub in maratan fa. If you read it without it, it would say, it is the same whether or not you beg forgiveness for them. Though you ask forgiveness for them, Allah will not forgive them. So that uh, makes sense. But it also makes sense, of course, the way that it uh, stands today. So when we go to Surah 9, verse 80 of the Quran today, we read that Allah told Muhammad, even if you ask forgiveness for a group of unbelievers 70 times, Allah will not forgive them. But when we go to an extremely early Quran, Allah simply tells Muhammad, even if you ask forgiveness for them, Allah will not forgive them. The 70 times is missing. The verse still makes sense without the 70 times, but it's obviously not the same as today's Quran, which is strange because virtually every Muslim I meet tells me that there's only one Quran and that there are no differences in any Quran manuscript anywhere. What happened to those words? The original scribe left them out, and the editor who came along later didn't add them back in, so it was apparently a perfectly acceptable reading. I thought these Muslims all had the Quran memorized, and that any Muslim who so much as glances at this passage would immediately recognize that there are missing words. If I didn't know better, which I don't, I might think that there are holes in the narrative. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Now, for you Muslims who believed your apologists when they told you that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad and that there are no variants anywhere in the manuscript tradition of the Quran, now's a good time to start wondering why your apologists lied to you. For you Muslims who know that there are textual variants in the Quran manuscripts, but you've been told by your apologists that the only variants are differences in pronunciation or dialect, now's a good time to start wondering why your apologists lied to you. One Quran saying 70 times and another not saying 70 times has nothing to do with different dialects. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, the, the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. These are now well known within the Western uh, Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be, you know, 100 years ago. You know, And by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. For you non-Muslims who are frustrated because your Muslim friends keep saying that the Quran has been perfectly preserved because they mindlessly believed what their lying apologists told them, rejoice. You've just seen a Quran manuscript that's clearly missing words. But Dr. Brubaker says he's compiled thousands of examples of textual variants and corrections. So if he continues making videos with photographs of Quran variants, how hilarious will it be two or three years from now when we've got piles of video clips and photographs of Qurans with missing words, different words, added words, corrections, and so on, and a Muslim tries to tell us about the miraculous preservation of the Quran. I eagerly await that day, and I would love to see stacks of Quran variants readily available in videos. So I encourage you to subscribe to Dr. Brubaker's channel. He only has one video so far, but I encourage you to watch it. I played a two-minute clip. His full video is much longer. 
The link to that video is in the description box. Hopefully he likes the response he gets and posts another video soon. It's kind of funny because Dr. Brubaker seems to be a nice guy who just wants to share some of his research on YouTube and help bridge the gap between the scholarly world and the popular world. But the information he's sharing is exactly what we need to wreak havoc on one of the biggest lies ever told. So he's going to be presenting pictures of variant Quran readings, and we're going to be putting the pictures in the faces of our Muslim friends who are victims of deceptive scholars and apologists. Fun times.